All right, there we go. Okay, so in Moodle for this week, I've placed some things. Let's see, we're in Module 3, Notable Figures in Wildlife Management, Wetlands and Waterfowl Management. Uh, <clears throat> we're on Lecture 4. That's what we're working on today. This is the online section, I guess. Put the video lecture in the wrong place. I need to add that to the internet, the online section, because that's definitely in person. Mm -hmm. Uh, your homework for this week was that you need to uh, post on this discussion forum about Theodore Roosevelt. You can read the directions there. I talked about that on Monday. Uh, we have uh, wetlands and waterfowl management we're going to be talking about in lab this afternoon. Here's your shirt polls for uh, men and women for, um, for the Columbia shirt if you're in the in-person section. I'm trying to look in front of my videos or my PowerPoint here. And like I said, we're going to finish up notable figures. PowerPoint ever loads. Oh, here she is. All right. Let me get us to the right slide. Let's see here. So we covered all these people last week. Muir and Pinchot. We talked about conservation versus preservation. And we ended at Theodore Roosevelt. And this was your discussion forum assignment is to talk about Theodore Roosevelt. So make sure you do that by Wednesday of next week. All right, so the next person on our list is Aldo Leopold. We have discussed Aldo Leopold quite a bit already, but I'll just a little bit more about, about Aldo. We won't dive too deep into him again, but if you watched that video, we talked to, we've, we've mentioned him several times. <clears throat> uh, on April 21st, 1948, Leopold was stricken with a heart attack while fighting a grass fire on a neighbor's farm. That's how he passed away. He was 61 years old. Of course, he's known as the father of wildlife management. I've told you that before. Uh, but he's also known as the father of the U.S. wilderness system. Uh, you, we watched in the video. He started the first national wilderness, in the Gila National Wilderness in Arizona uh, in New Mexico. Uh, he was a conservationist, forester, philosopher, educator, writer, and outdoor enthusiast. He graduated from Yale. You know that already. He started his career with the U.S. Forest Service because there was no such thing as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the time. There was no such thing as wildlife management. Uh, at age 24, he was the supervisor for the Car Carson National Forest in New Mexico. Uh, in 1922, he was instrumental in developing the proposal to manage the Gila National Forest as a, as a wilderness area. That was the first wilderness area in, in, in the world. He wrote the book Game Management, published it in 1933. That was the first uh, textbook in the field of wildlife management. Also that same year, he became the chair of the Game Management Department at the, the University of Wisconsin at Madison. That was the first such department that ever existed. Of course, he wrote Sand County Almanac. We talked about that a little bit. I had you read a, a, one of the stories out of Sand County Almanac about the green fire. A couple of more quotes from uh, Leopold. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Uh, and then here Leopold gives us a, a definition for conservation. Conservation is the state of harmony between men and land. Uh, don't get confused. Remember, we talked about the difference between conservation and preservation. Uh, remember, conservation is is uh, conserving wild, uh, uh, conserving natural resources through wise use, and preservation is preserving natural resources and not using them at all. <clears throat> uh, and so, Leopold has his own definition of conservation. It's a state of harmony between men and land. Uh, he also uh, was quoted to say, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. So if you, I think he used the analogy of a clock. So if you're a clock repairman or repair woman, 
and you took apart a clock and you had it all sitting here on your table. Well, the first step to putting it all back together is that you better have all the pieces that you took out. So if you think of an ecosystem like a clock, if we remove pieces and we don't put them back, that's a problem, right? So to, if we want to tinker with natural resources, that's fine. Maybe we can do that. But the first rule of tinkering is to keep every piece. So that's every little part of the ecosystem. So to just say, this is useless, I don't need it. Well, we don't know that yet. This is a very complex thing that as humans, we don't fully understand, right? So I can't say, well, this little beetle has no importance to the universe. I don't know. It may be the only food source for some other organism, which is the only food source for some other. And then we cause some cascading effect that we don't even really know about. <clears throat> Another quote, we abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. This is what is called the land ethic. So being an ethical person includes um, understanding that we don't own the natural resources in this country or in this world. We are a part of it. We are a part of the community of the natural resources around us. And when we begin to see land and animals and all of that as a community which we live in, you take responsibility for that community, we'll care for it a lot better. So if we could, you know, this was uh, uh, Leopold's idea was to change the world's thought on how we view natural resources. And we need to view it as a, this is a, this isn't something we're apart from. We are a part of it. Uh, another quote, we shall never achieve harmony with the land any more than we shall achieve absolute justice or liberty for people. In these higher aspirations, the important thing is not to achieve, but to strive. So in other words, you can never attain perfection, but you should always be trying to get there. We can always do better, and so we should do better. Always. Just always trying to get better. That's the that's the point of life in general. It's just, just try to get better. Do better tomorrow than you did today. Maybe you don't. Try again the next day. That's That's life. We'll move on from... Mr. Leopold to Herb Stoddard, uh, 1889 to 1970. Herb Stoddard is an all-star in the field of wildlife management. We're going to talk about a lot of the stuff that uh, Mr. Stoddard did. He was an early pioneer for prescribed fire management. Uh, he has some quotes. Land management is an art that builds on history and is based in science. <clears throat> he's got a lot of titles. We call him a lot of things. He's the king of the fire forest because he, he is all about prescribed fire. He's the father of prescribed fire. He's the father of Bob White quail management, the father of Southern quail plantation management, and the father of ecosystem management. Like I said, Herb Stoddard did a lot of stuff, particularly here in the South. <clears throat> He moved to Florida with his family from Illinois, and shortly after he got there, uh, he, was, he was pretty young, four years old. Uh, he discovered a bird's nest on the shores of Lake Mills. Uh, despite him constantly visiting the nest and being pretty curious, uh, this ground dove that he was monitoring it did manage to hatch its two eggs. Uh, and at that point, he was hooked. And he said, none of the many thousands of bird's nests I have found since that day some belonging to exceedingly rare birds have thrilled me quite as much as that one. Uh, he wrote in his memoirs later on uh, that the discovery launched me on my career as a student of birds and marked my beginning as an ornithologist. He wasn't just an ornithologist. He was an outdoorsman uh, and self-taught ecologist, forester, and quail expert whose ideas on conservation evolved into a holistic land ethic that became the model for generations to come. Uh, so in 1924, he was hired by the Bureau of Biological Survey, which eventually became the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and they had hired him to uh, study habitat and life history of quail in the Red Hills located between Thomasville, Georgia and Tallahassee, Florida. In 1931, he published a book called The Bob White Quail, Its Habits, Preservations and Increase. It was the first comprehensive study of quail but it was also a landmark study uh, in the field of wildlife management. 
to not just quail, but for the whole field. In 1941, he started a forestry consulting business in Thomasville, Georgia. Uh, there, he advised private landowners on how to reap the benefits of longleaf pine timber without decimating the whole forest. We'll talk about longleaf pine and wh what's happened to longleaf pine forests uh, at some point in this semester. But suppression of fire has led to, to lots of changes in this country. Uh, while earlier management efforts on wildlife involved little more than setting state hung hunting regulations or eradicating predators or artificially propagating game birds, Stoddard argued that wildlife populations could be sustained and increased through the, through the active management of natural processes. So this is where we start getting our modern idea of wildlife management, where we can actually sustain and increase populations of wildlife by what we do to the land. He promoted single tree selection or what we call uneven age management for forest management, uh, both of which maintain valuable trees and are more concerned with forest health than mass productivity rather than money from timber. So we're, he's switching from this forest is just wood. That's all it is. That's all we'd use it for to this forest also produces food for wildlife. It's a healthy forest that produces what we call ecosystem services for us as humans. Uh, and there is some value to having forest land around. Uh, but he also believed in management of that forest land, single tree, select, or single tree selection. So that means you go in, you pick a tree, and you cut that one down. That mimics natural regeneration more, more than a clear cut would in, in some cases. Sometimes a clear cut is natural, right? If a rock slide happened or a fire, a big fire happened in an area, you might have something like a clear cut. And those did happen frequently before humans were here. Uh, but you also have trees that age and just die from old age and then fall over. So to mimic that, we do what's called single tree selection. We just pick a tree and we cut that one down. <clears throat> uh, he had a strong belief in the use of fire as a management tool. And that was a technique that sparked controversy and even contempt from other professionals. He had a big fight ahead of him and we're still fighting that fight. Uh, U.S. Forest Service agents had for years discour discouraged burning. The agency Smokey the Bear campaign intended to curb careless and indiscriminate use of fire, but it actually just turned the public against prescribed burns completely. Only you can prevent forest fires. Wrong. That is entirely wrong. Smokey the Bear is one of the worst things that ever happened to natural resources management in the history of the world. He was part of a mass brainwashing, convincing America that fire is bad. That is an evil thing. It is not. It is a natural part of the ecosystem. And what we're dealing with today, especially if you look out west, you even see here Gatlinburg a few years ago. Some fires are happening here this year. That's We're dealing with that because of Smokey the Bear. Because of so many people took to heart, we cannot burn the forest. Oh, my God, look at all the fire. What will the animals do? They're animals. They're going to run away. They know what fire is. They're not going to stand there and burn to death. That's not, it's not, have you ever seen a deer just stand there and wait for the fire? It's not how it works. It's not how it works. So Stoddard maintained that fire was essential to preventing pine forest succession to, into hardwoods, which it is. Uh, perpetuating that fire dependent flora and fauna, so animals that rely on fire, uh, and allowing food sources for game animals to prevail over encroaching undergrowth. So in other words, we're clearing out the land a little bit and we're letting some more uh, important food items grow up for wildlife. Landowners who practice con conservative cutting and frequent variable burns determined by factors like season, wind patterns, plant growth stages, learn they could reap benefits from their land indefinitely in the form of timber, hunting, aesthetics, and whatever else they wanted to cultivate. In other words, fire doesn't ruin the landscape. It improves the landscape. What's bad is wildfires, is letting so much wood pile up in the forest floor that when a fire does happen, we can't put it out. That's a wildfire. That is bad. 
We don't want that to happen. That kills all the trees in the forest. It can kill lots of animals. It's a bad thing. What we want is a nice slow burn, a controlled burn. So we, as land managers, can set those fires ourselves and do it under controlled conditions. And you're going to learn how to do that as a wildlife major. <clears throat> uh, Stoddard came to the Red Hills of Florida in 1924 as a leader of a study that was sponsored by wealthy landowners and carried out through the U.S. Bureau of Biological Survey. Again, the Bureau of Biological Survey eventually became the Fish and Wildlife Service. His goal was to examine the life history and preferred habitat of Bob White quail uh, and develop a management scheme to reverse population declines. He had no formal education, but he had an open mind and lots of experience. His expertise was really called into practice on quail hunting reserves in the 1920s and 30s in Southwest Georgia. There, he led a biological survey of quails, of the quail's life cycle to understand declines in local populations. Stoddard and his neighbor, Harry Beetle, incorporated the Cooperative Quail Study Association in 1931. That supplied uh, plantation owners with advice on increasing quail numbers, on how to increase quail numbers on their lands, and added some legitima legitimacy to the term wildlife management. So in our young field here in 1931, Herb Stoddard's out there talking with landowners, preaching about wildlife management, about the benefits of fire, even though a lot of his contemporaries were saying, no, fire's bad. Uh, but he was he was out there saying, yep, it's good. Aldo Leopold was a proponent of fire. <clears throat> in 1957, Harry Beetle, a sportsman and amateur naturalist, donated property in Tallahassee, Florida, for the creation of what is now called the Tall Timbers Research Station. You should write that one down, Tall Timbers Research Station. Stoddard and some friends turned that land into a model working landscape where sustainable forestry and consumptive use could exist. Tall Timbers still exists today. It is the premier, premier place for quail research. Um, and it is a and fire research, and it's an awesome place to visit. Uh, if you're lucky as a student here, you may get to go volunteer at Tall Timbers Research Station. We sent some students there last last semester, um, and they said it was fantastically amazing. So it's a cool place. I got a couple of friends that I graduated with that work there as well. So we can send you there for things. Uh, Stoddard helped create the new profession of wildlife management with his landmark book, The Bob White Quail. He reinstated fire into the landscape, beginning a management revolution that's still playing out today. We're still having this argument of you need to burn. And if you say that to somebody from the West, they're going to get all mad and say, oh, well, there's too much wood in the forest now. It's, yeah, because you didn't burn because you're not burning. Burn the dang forest. Burn the wood that's in the forest floor or this is going to keep happening anyway do it under do it when the conditions are right when the humidity is the right level maybe it just rained a couple of days ago so the fire doesn't get completely out of control don't just let nature take care of it she's going to wait till it's really dry and and really prone for fire and then she's going to light a match and you're not going to be able to stop it that's the whole point of prescribed fire is that we do it under controlled conditions. Uh, and of course, Herb Stoddard was the first to advocate for preservation of working cultural landscapes as a vital reservoir and ecological diversity. Uh, and in, in other words, an integrated land management system is an ecosystem, is ecosystem management. The entire ecosystem, you're thinking about everything, the plants, the animals, the insects, all of it. Next up, we've got Robert, or typically called Bob Marshall. In fact, you'll always just hear him referred to as Bob Marshall. I don't hear him called Robert Marshall ever. He was the principal founder of the Wildlife Society. I'm sorry, Wilderness Society, not the Wildlife Society, the Wilderness Society. He cherished looking across open an open expanse of wilderness, knowing that neither road nor motorized vehicle pollution nor human settlement would intrude upon the serenity and inherent the in the pristine vista uh so bob marshall was was big into big open landscapes with no 
development. He was born in 1901 in New York City. So he grew up among massive development. He was the son of German immigrants. His father was a prominent lawyer and active conservationist and a leader in the Jewish community. Uh, when Bob was young, he was educated in the city, but he spent uh, spent the 21 summers of his youth at Knollwood, which is his family summer home in the lower Sarnak Lake, uh, which is in the Adirondack Mountains of, the, of New York. So he spent his summers out in the country, basically. Uh, there, here, here, he and his brothers, George and James, learned to use a compass and a map. Uh, between 1918 and 24, Bob and George climbed 42 of 46 Adirondack peaks that were all above 4,000 feet. Then he later reclimbed the remaining four. On July 15, 1932, he set the record of a different sort by climbing 14 peaks within 19 hours, uh, a feat that required a total ascent of 13,600 feet. So basically he walked for an entire day up and down mountains. He decided in his teens that he wanted to be a forester. He said, I love the woods and the solitude. He wrote at the time, I should hate to spend the greater part of my lifetime in a stuffy office or in a crowded city. That's what we're all doing here, right? <clears throat> By 1930, Marshall had earned three degrees, including a PhD in forestry from John Hopkins University. He was the director of forestry from the, uh, from the Interior Department's Office of Indian Affairs. Uh, he later headed the rec uh, recreation of lands and forest service for the forest forest service. Excuse me. He was big into uh, forest recreation. He was a visionary in the truest sense of the word. He set an unprecedented course for wilderness preservation in the United States. His ideas and dreams continue to be realized long after his death. He was only 38 when he died. So he was young. That was in 1939. He was among the first to suggest that large tracts of Alaska be preserved and shape the U.S. Forest Service policy on wilderness designation and management. <clears throat> with a doctorate in forestry, he was well acquainted with the logic of scientific argument and the economic underpinnings of the federal forest policies. But he spoke from the heart. He was not an armchair explorer. In other words, he didn't just sit in his uh, his chair at his house and read books and things like that and imagine he was exploring he went out into the world uh, and actually interacted with the world to figure out what what is happening he didn't just read it in a book he went and figured it out for himself he was a man of limitless energy who believed he would have been more at home during the time of lewis and clark uh, than when he lived uh than the 1950s <clears throat> when there were adventures and never-ending expanses around every, every bend. Uh, he regularly made 30 and 40 mile long or longer day hikes, and he preferred tennis shoes over heavy hiking boots. That's an interesting fact about Bob Marshall. He went hiking in tennis shoes. Most people use boots, but he was a tennis shoe guy. He loved to map unknown regions of uh, personally and personally underwrote a new government map of the U.S. roadless areas. So any place there were not roads, he went and helped map those. He was famous for, for his hiking speed. He went to walk 70 miles in a 24-hour period to make, uh, to make connections for a trip. While, all, while at other times, he easily outdistanced his companions on trips into the mountains. Hey, it's all right. uh we're, we're kind of pressed for time but we finished in about 20 minutes okay i'll wait yeah thank you okay. <clears throat> uh let's see here his book arctic village chronicled his experiences while living with the eskimos let's call them inuit people now and whites uh in wiseman between 1930 and 1931 uh he was a 1930 this book was a 1933 bestseller he died of heart failure on an overnight train in November 1939. He was independently wealthy. That was nice. He left one quarter of his $1.5 million estate to the Wilderness Society, assuring that the society uh, would exist uh, and showing his commitment to wilderness preservation for a year to come. 
The following year, the Forest Service reclassified and renamed three primitive areas in non Montana as the Bob Marshall Wilderness, and it is still known as that today. All right, next person, Dr. Carl Alwyn Shank. Dr. Shank uh, should, is near and dear to our hearts here at Haywood. He was bar born in Germany, and he was educated in Germany as a forester. He was invited to the United States by George Vanderbilt to manage the Vanderbilt estate here in North Carolina. All right, that's the Biltmore estate. He had around 145,000 acres to manage on the, on the Vanderbilt estate. After his death, uh, Vanderbilt's widow sold approximately 86,000 acres of the of the um, the estate to the U.S. Forest Service at five dollars an acre. That fulfills her fulfilled her husband's wishes to create the core of the Pisgah National Forest. That's what we call the Pisgah National Forest today. You recreate out there. This was done by a private landowner who decided that they wanted there to be a national forest. So they sold their land at $5 an acre. There's only 8,000 of it that remain today, of that original 86,000. There's only 8,000 left as, a, as Pisgah National Forest. Dr. Shank was a pioneer in American forestry education. He established the forest, first forestry education in the United States at the Biltmore School of Forestry in 1898. That is where the cradle will be held uh, in a few weeks, the Cradle of Forestry, uh, or the competition is at the Cradle of Forestry. Um, and that is, you, you can go up there and you'll do that in Dendrology with Shannon. He's going to take you up to um, the Cradle of Forestry. You're going to go watch a little video about Carl Alwyn Shank. He's going to take you into the schoolhouse where Shank had his, his group of people uh, or his students come learn. Um, so you're going to get to do that. But that was here. Shank would have been here. And uh, Shannon always says he likes to think our program is somewhat of an extension of that Vanderbilt School of Forestry. He was a tireless worker. His days were characterized by lectures lasting several hours in the morning, and they were followed by a full afternoon field trips into the forest. Evenings were spent preparing additional lectures, reviewing and grading students' diaries, appraising forest working plans, writing textbooks, corresponding with past and present prospective students, uh, fulfilling many and various other responsibilities connected with the operation of an active forestry school. The Biltmore Forest School was our first working, were our first working professional foresters in this country. And that's why you can buy a license plate that says North Carolina first in forestry, because we were the state that first had a forestry program or and it was this school, Biltmore School of Forestry. <clears throat> uh, initially, he was pretty much working with sons of wealthy lumber and timber barons. Uh, but within 15 years, the school uh, graduated over 400 forestry students who introduced scientific forestry methods throughout the United States and North America, actually, not just the United States. Unlike classroom-based forestry programs, the Biltmore Forest School emphasized the practical side of the profession. Instructing students in a field-based course of study that included hands-on learning. So he was out in the field doing stuff, which is what we try to do in this program. Uh, this is him and his students at Sunburst, North Carolina in 1911. Shortly after Shank developed his program here, here Cornell, the University of Minnesota, and Yale each created their own forestry schools. But we were where Shank was first. Unlike these university-based classrooms, Shank's Biltmore School emphasized the practical side of the profession. He's famous for this quote, and this is on George's email. If you don't know George Hahn yet, you will get to know him. He's our forestry instructor, but this is he always always noticed this little quote at the bottom of his emails. Send the kids into the woods. They are better for them and than any classrooms made out of brick. So go out into the woods. It's better than a classroom. And, I, and we agree with that sentiment for the most part. Although there are some things we have to do in the classroom. All right. We're getting close to the end here. 
J and Ding Darling, J Norwood Darling. We already talked a little bit about him uh, last week when we talked about ducks. He's the father of the federal duck stamp program. He advocated for wise use of natural resources and protection of wildlife. So that's conservation, not preservation. Uh, he was an excellent public speaker and an articulate in writing and as a cartoonist. He devoted his special talents to conservation, education, and to developing programs and institutions which would benefit wildlife. He was a renowned editorial cartoonist who advocated conservation for our nation's natural resources. You already knew that. We talked a little bit about that before. Uh, he's got a lot of really cool cartoons. One of his most famous cartoons was titled, How Rich Will We Be When We Have Converted All Our Forests, All Our Soil, All Our Water Resources, and All Our Minerals Into Cash. <clears throat> uh, this best illustrates both his conservation ethic and his remarkable ability to convey complex thoughts with a few strokes of the pen. There's also a quote that's um, attributed to all lots of different people, but in reality, nobody knows the quote, but it's something around, along the lines of, um, um, you know, only when we've destroyed the last blade of grass and tree and food item will we realize that you can't eat money. That some, you know, money is not the end all be all of the world. We actually need food and air and space to live in. Money isn't really that important for survival is until we gave it value, something to keep in mind. Uh, this one was called, What Man Does to the Most Beautiful Gift of Nature, the River. So he was looking around, seeing lots of pollution being dumped into the river, um, just unmitigated pollution, uh, land clearings, lots of soil conservation issues. Uh, he was looking around, just seeing all these problems. And this is right before the Dust Bowl happened, right? So he's looking at topsoil washing away the river is polluted things are getting real bad here he mentions the topsoil which goes swirling by in our rivers at flood stage may look like mud to you but it's actually beefsteak and potatoes ham and eggs and homemade bread with jam on it that's where all that food grows is in that topsoil that all washed away down the river it's still happening every time it rains watch the rivers notice that they turn they will start looking like you who well, that's all the topsoil washing away. It takes 10,000 years to build an inch of topsoil. And then it just washes away in a rainstorm down the river. Soil conservation is a big deal. The title of this uh, uh, cartoon was what, the, what That Mud in Our River Adds Up to Each Year. And it adds up to all the food washing down the stream. In 1930, disappearing habitat, drought, overhunting, reduced waterfowl populations and alarmingly low numbers, uh, Darling believed that the disappearance of any species voted poorly for mankind. And he was quoted as saying, so go ducks, so goes man. If we let them go extinct, we will be next. Uh, and then um, he, he made the cartoon, what a few more seasons will do to the ducks. And he, when he, what he meant by this is unregulated seasons. So what a few more unregulated seasons would do to the ducks. All of his pictures were drawn before the advent of television, and many were drawn before there was even radio. Uh, so his commu he communicated to the public however possible at the time and was very effective at doing that. In 1934, he was named the chief of the Bureau of Biological Survey, the first chief of the Bureau of Biological Survey, which eventually became the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, more than 550 refuges and 100 million acres are found in the National Refuge System. He laid the groundwork for the National Refuge, Refuge System. Uh, that the national, the U.S. National Wildlife Refuge System is the world's largest system of lands and waters whose primary purpose is the conservation of wildlife and their habitats. He was also instrumental in the conception and development of a stamp uh, to be bought by all waterfowl hunters that would generate funds and pay for the acquiring and preser preserving of habitat for ducks, geese, and swans. And that is the duck stamp. Uh, Ding's first stamp was created on March 16, 1934. 
That's when Congress passed the President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I'm sorry, Congress passed the the Migratory Bird Hunting Stamp Act, and Franklin Roosevelt signed it in 1934, March 16th. 635,001 stamps were sold that year. That's a lot for 1934. Didn't have as many people back then. Darling was the founder of the National Wildlife Federation. And today, the National Wildlife Federation works with over 4 million member partners and supports and supporters to actively educate, inspire, and promote achievable solutions to protect wildlife for our children's future. There's a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations out there that claim they're pro-wildlife, and most of them are, um, but a lot of them are misinformed or have some part in misinforming the public. PETA is a big example of, a, of an organization that doesn't really know what they're talking about half the time, um, and we'll get into that. Uh, but the National Wildlife Federation, if you're looking for someone to donate to, this is a good one. They're promoting sound, scientific, natural resources management. That's the important part. We base our management on science, not on our opinions, not on, oh, it's a really cute animal, on what is that animal's purpose in the ecosystem and how do we manage it? That's the important thing. That's the science behind this. We don't just base this on our emotions. And the National Wildlife Federation is a good one to get into. Uh, he created the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit Program in 1935. That organization worked diligently to organize wild, the wildlife administrations in America. So it helped set up state game, or, uh, game management organizations. Uh, it also helped at the federal level uh, make a framework for how we manage wildlife. It had three objectives, the Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. Education. So scientists teach university courses at the graduate level, provide academic guidance to graduate students, and serve on academic committees. So in other words, we're going to produce scientists at a master's level education, people who have studied wildlife management. His other objective was research, which was also based out of the universities. We're going to look at information. We're going to look at data and see what is actually going on with our wildlife populations. And then his third, um, uh, the third uh, objective that he was focused on was technical assistance. So sending professionals out to people, to the public, to provide some technical assistance. Uh, this, if you could think about the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, they provide a lot of technical assistance to landowners. If you've got a big plot of land and you need some help managing it or you need some advice for what's good for natural resources, well, the Natural Resource Commission Service, or sorry, Conservation Service is is what will provide you some technical assistance. Uh, you also have land grant universities uh, in North Carolina. We've got North Carolina State, Tennessee's got the University of Tennessee, Georgia's the University of Georgia, um, and these institutions have fish and wildlife management programs. They have uh, forestry programs. They have agriculture programs, and the, the, all those programs have outreach uh, to the public that can provide assistance and technical assistance. And all that comes from Ding Darling pushing these three objectives on the to the country. The last person we'll cover is Rachel Carson, 1907 to 1964. Rachel Carson was a marine biologist. She was a nature writer. And her writers are credited with launching the global environmental movement. They also helped uh, towards the creation of the EPA. In fact, she is often given credit for establishing the EPA with her writing. Her distinction in both writing and biology won her a part-time position at the U.S. Bureau of, Bi of Fisheries in 1935. That's now the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She was asked to create a series of seven-minute radio programs on marine life called Romance Under the Waters. Her first book was called Under, sea Under the Sea Wind, it highlighted her unique ability to present deeply intricate scientific material in clear poetic language that could be that could captivate her readers and pique their interest in the natural world. 
Uh, she was moved to the position of assistant editor and then editor in chief of all Fish and Wildlife Service publications. Her last book was written in 1962, A Silent Spring, and it was a big one. Uh, it awakened society uh, to a responsibility to other forms of life. Uh, in other words, the premise of the book was, what would it be like if you went into the forest and it was silent? There was no birds, there were no insects, there was no wind, no leaves rustling, no nothing. It was just silent. What would, it, what would the world be like? Would that be a good world to be in? Most people think no. Uh, she documented in, my, in minute biological detail the true menace of the ecosystem, the true menace to the ecosystem caused by harmful pesticides, particularly DDT. Uh, and we, D, and she was credited with getting DDT banned. At least the book is is credited with that, and it stirred up public opinion. And we wound up banning DDT. By the way, people are talking about bringing DDT back. That's a really bad idea. If you didn't know, we'll talk about that in ornithology. Uh, her marine studies, uh, were, while there had uh, provided her with an early documentation of the effects of DDT on marine life. She created a firestorm of controversy in the pesticide industry with farmers, wildlife managers, and all kinds of other people. But she was right, and, and that's a good thing. There's some pictures of Rachel Carson. And again, we'll talk about DDT and ornithology in more detail. Uh, so that's it for today. For a lecture, we'll have lab this afternoon. Remember, we'll have a lab quiz. If you're in person, if you're watching this in a video, I'll be posting the lab quiz. I think I've already posted a lab quiz for this week. Um, there'll be a new one for next week. So everybody uh, have a great afternoon. Come to the Wildlife Society meeting at noon. And uh, there are donuts out in the lobby, by the way. That's what the lady just came and whispered to me while I was talking. So please grab a donut. They'd like you to take some.